We're prepping for Paris Fashion Week right now, and this is the fourth video that I'm filming in a single day. And while I guess maybe these seem pretty casual and laid back, I am fucking exhausted right now. I love my job so much. I would not trade this for the world. What is your opinion on the extreme exclusivity of some fashion brands? Yeah, this is a pretty good question. I guess if, you, if you're looking at like Essence and you happen to accidentally hit sort high to low and you see stuff like this, Ooh. it just sort of makes you go like, what? Ooh. Hu what humans even are involved in this stuff? What? I know it's easy to feel like the high price point especially is just the brand communicating to you like, hey, fuck you, peasant. But I do think that most exclusivity factors for luxury brands come from the spirit of the idea that things are more attractive when they're more mysterious. And I mean, that's, that's kind of true in a lot of ways. Like if you live in a town where you don't have any access to Bottega Veneta, you really love what Matthew Blasey is doing at Bottega Veneta. And then you finally like go to New York or you go to like Chicago or Atlanta or Miami and you're like, I'm going, I'm fucking going to a Bottega Veneta store. Dude, this is gonna be so sick. And then you go into one of those stores, it would have a lot of impact to it. There are some brands where it's like, we would love to get some Atelier footage so that we're able to kind of describe to her. And they're like, we got to cut you off right there. No one can come in the Atelier with cameras. I don't think that's so much because they got to protect their specific processes and stuff as much. And, and that is, by the way, that's part of it. But I think the larger thing is that they're like, I don't want to show everybody how the stuff gets made. I want it to feel like this big, beautiful mystery. I am, of course, very much of a different mindset that the more details that you know and the deeper you're able to dive into that world, the more you're likely to appreciate it. And if we're just thinking from the brand's perspective, the more likely people are to spend money with it in the modern world. Back in the 1960s, yes, I do think people wanted to be sold some kind of big, beautiful mystery. I just don't think that that's the zeitgeist of where we are at today, but that is still how many of these fashion brands operate. Also, I, th I think that another part of the, the price point thing, and I mean, again, yes, are there brands that are like, like, fuck you with their price point? Yes, like Philip Pline comes to mind. There are definitely brands where they're just sort of like, just throwing out stuff and just seeing what sells and then, okay, well, we'll discount it by 50%, such a great deal, pay me $2,000 for this plastic bag. But for the most part, I think that like, again, we'll, we'll take Bottega Veneta. I think that Bottega Veneta's point in having a, a coat, I don't know how much their coats cost, maybe $15,000, I'm Ooh. sure we could find a coat that costs over $10,000 by Bottega Veneta. I don't think the point here is for you to go like, oh my, I could never afford, clearly I am not, this is not for me. I don't think that they're wanting to like dunk on your wallet. I think more what they're kind of trying to elicit with the price is like confusion and intrigue. Like being like, why would some, I've never even heard of a $15,000 coat. Like why would that ever even need to, what are they doing over there that makes it where these coats are? What, what is Bottega Veneta? I think it's supposed to sort of excite and intrigue you rather than like make you feel shitty about yourself. Am, am I going to deny that sometimes these price points do make people feel bad about themselves? No, I mean, of course that happens. Like that that's a, that's a bummer side effect of this thing happening. But I think when, when brands are looking at like all of the ways that they can be communicating with the public, there are obvious ways. So like commercials are a really obvious one. How else? Uh, designers in interviews, like the, the main designer, when they give an interview, that is another way that the brand can kind of be telling their story. The furniture design of a company in, in their stores, the curation of furniture at Bottega Veneta is unbe fucking leaveable and it really helps to build out the world that they're building especially if you go to a flagship store it's crazy you'll want to spend hours in there it's so beautiful how do they package their stuff what what stores are they carried in is a very overlooked way that a brand communicates to other people because if you will notice hermes is available in one place the hermes store hermes is not carried on essence hermes is not carried at Bergdorf Goodman, Lavia Savama Veroma, or whatever. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm just trying to remember that other retailer's name. There is nowhere that carries them other than the Hermes store. Supreme, Supreme is carried in two places, Supreme and Dover Street Market, that's it. So especially when you get into luxury companies, there are actually hundreds of ways that they are communicating with the public and kind of, I mean, what we often say on this channel is world building. One of the ways, especially when you have a price point where you're not really looking to sell it. I mean, we've talked about this before, but they make the profit margins on handbags. Most companies are making it through fragrances and cosmetics, small leather goods, shoes and stuff. They're usually, there are very, very few brands that make all of their profit margins from clothes because 
Most people, unfortunately, think of fast fashion and a designer handbag as a, a, a good pairing. I, I'm not sure where that comes from. Back to the point, brands, especially luxury brands, have hundreds of ways of kind of building out their world. And when you have a, ca a whole category of your business ready to wear clothing, that they're not, I mean, for a lot of brands, that makes up 4% of their bottom line profit margin. It's very, very small. And when you break it down to individual pieces, it's like, Dude, if we if we sell a couple of shirts, like that's more of the profit margin than we were expecting to make this season anyway. And so like things like the coat, they start thinking of the price point, the number that's attached to that as being like that could kind of we can sort of manipulate that a little bit to start telling our story differently or to give people kind of a different mental experience about the brand. The, the more like sinister capitalistic side of this, which is also a legitimate part of it, is that if you walk into, let's now just use something else, if you walk into a Prada store and go, holy shit, this is a $11,000 coat. That is, un if you are somehow unfamiliar with Prada before you went into the store and you see that $11,000 coat, you're like, whoa, am I even allowed to touch it? Holy shit, that is like, how is a coat $11,000? And then mentally, you start thinking like, wow, Prada must be just this like, just titan of quality and what what is going on at Prada? And then a $90 lipstick starts looking a lot more reasonable, even if in your head you would be, before you walked into the store, you were like, I would never, why would I ever spend more than like 20 bucks on lipstick? That doesn't make any sense. Now suddenly, because of the $11,000 number that's attached to that coat, you now are like, geez, like there's, maybe there's something magic in this lipstick that, I mean, Prada seems, I mean, $11,000 coat, maybe the lipstick is worth $90. Part of it is to kind of create some intrigue with the brand. Another part of it is to sort of like, be like, by comparison, 90 bucks for lipstick, maybe, maybe that's kind of cheap. Price serves more purposes than just, this is how much the commodity costs. They're, they're using it kind of to psychologically control you a little bit, and then also to be part of like the brand storytelling. Then there's a, the whole other thing about like Hermes, where exclusivity for them literally means some people just like aren't allowed to have it. If you go into an Hermes store today, and say, I wanna buy a Kelly bag, uh, 45 size in uh, palladium hardware, uh, navy, and let's do swift leather. Can I have it now, please? I'm in a hurry. You will be very disappointed, even if you have eight grand or 10 grand or whatever it is to give them for that, uh, they will just tell you we don't have any. The idea with Hermes is that you need to be like an established Hermes customer in order to be able to buy the quota bags, which are the, the Kelly, the Birkin, the super famous one, and the Constance. So you can't just come in and buy it. I mean, Rolex does the same thing. You walk into any Rolex and say, I'd like to buy a Submariner, and they'd be like, we don't have any watches here at all, sir. Please come back in seven years. Audemars PA does the same thing. Anyway, so the, the idea here is that it's like, you we need to kind of vet you and figure out like if if you're the Hermes person. Usually that just means that you need to go in there and buy, you know, a handful of things over the course of a few different months that are, you know, $400, $500 each. Buy some scarves as Christmas gifts for somebody and then come back in and buy like a teacup for your aunt for her birthday and then come back in and buy like a belt for your husband and then like buy another scarf for yourself and then, oh, magically, now we can offer you a Kelly. So yeah, there's like a little like game involved. Then there's like the exclusivity of runway shows, which a lot of people complain about. If I'm thinking about this from the company's perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Honestly, like if they're putting on a runway show and the total cost of the runway show is like 1.2 million dollars and there are 600 chairs that means every chair is worth 1714 dollars um i i don't feel like they should or have to give away that 1700 dollar chair to just someone who is interested or really hyped up about the brand it makes sense to me at least from thinking purely from the company's perspective that they would say is this person going to provide us with $1,714 worth of benefit in the future if we give them this chair for this runway show today? And for a lot of people, that answer ends up being no. And I think a lot of people sort of take that to mean like, oh, you guys are assholes. You're just like trying to keep me out or whatever. They spent a lot of money on that show. And it's, I mean, it's disappointing to me too when I'm told no for a runway show, but it's like, I get it. Like whatever calculus you guys use to determine whether or not I will be of that amount of benefit for you, I just didn't pass the test. Then on the all the way other edge of this, like a fourth type of exclusivity is like Jeffrey B. Small, who is a, a designer. I, I consider him to be one of the, if we're just talking about quality of garments, it's Jeffrey B. Small over everyone. I, I really don't think anyone can beat him on quality. His clothes are unbelievably 
expensive. And it's also incredibly hard to find them. You, you usually can't buy them online. Blue Mountain School is, I think, the only e-commerce site that I know of that carries Jeffrey B. Small new. But I mean, the thing is that like, everything is handmade. And it's because he's just, he's obsessed with quality. He is so into the mechanics and the processes and the systems that produce, where did this thread come from? How is this textile made? Like, what does the weave actually mean? What's the difference in like this weave and a slightly different weave? What are the property differences? This to me, does he is the only example, and I, I, there may be other ones out in the world, I'm not saying this definitively, but to me, just bliss the YouTuber and fashion critic, this is the only one where the prices seem warranted. And so that is kind of a different type of exclusivity where it's like, I, I wanna buy a bunch of Jeffrey B. Small. Like, good luck, you kinda have to like find it first. I would love to hear what everybody else thinks about this. Those are my general thoughts. Uh, we might have more in the future. Man, that was a long answer. I did not realize that it would be like, there are four branches to the tree of exclusivity and luxury. Did you study fashion? Like in school, I mean? No, I didn't. And I actually don't think that that would have been better for me to do. So I have a, a, an English degree that focused on literature. Essentially what a literature degree is doing in, in the American liberal arts is it is teaching you how to think analytically. Pretty early, like right around like junior year, they start telling you that like books are obviously very important, poetry is very beautiful, but these principles that we're using to analyze these things and sort of pull meaning out of them, those same principles can be applied to everything. It can be applied to a restaurant menu, it can be applied to a advertisement on TV for the army. It can be applied to the way that a rug is made, the systems that produce a good at Walmart. All, all the analysis can be applied to everything. It's everything can be read as text. And that has turned out to be maybe the biggest, most useful thing that I've ever been taught in my entire life. So it's essentially just four years of them teaching you how to determine the ways in which things make meaning. Daniela also has a political science master's degree. My wife, I'm proud to say my wife is more educated than me. It's pretty cool. And that that specifically, actually, if we're just talking about general education, like, I mean, you have only been educated in like heavy emphasis on political science, international relations, uh, policy. Am I missing anything? Okay. And what that did and what I've just been, I, I keep being re-surprised over and over. Because when we met, it was like, oh, there's this like cute girl that I'm dating and stuff. And like, she really likes fashion like me. So that's cool. Because I can get excited with her and like talk with her about fashion. And she can like hang out while I like edit videos. Or maybe like while I'm writing something, I'll be like, what's a good example of like this? And she'll have like a cool answer for me. But then I found out that, oh no, Daniela is like the perfect fashion critic. What grad school seems to teach people, I wouldn't know firsthand, but I've heard a lot about it. What grad school seems to teach people is it teaches them how to think in complex systems. All of the world, of course, is just composed of really complicated systems, all of which overlap, and none of which can be really discussed in a vacuum without leaving a lot of the story out. So grad school, especially for political things, or I mean, really it's the same for literature and for, for art and everything. It's just, it's teaching you how to think about all of these systems as they are interconnected and to understand and appreciate when something is extremely complex. It has turned out that her ability to understand that stuff for political things translates very well to her being able to look at the first Prada show and understand what's really being communicated by Mucha. Additionally, it, I mean, it helps her a ton for being able to quickly and effectively research things and gather information and compress that information into a solid summary. It also makes it where like she's way faster at writing scripts than I am. I am extremely slow at writing and she is very, very fast and efficient with that kind of stuff. Next. Who should be the creative director at Moschino? That is a good question. Man, what a tragedy has beset Moschino recently. That sucks. That new creative director that they put in there, uh, he just died like a few days into his role there. He, I, I assume this was like kind of the highlight of his, of his professional life at least. And he just like, he just dies. It's, it's crazy, fucking crazy. But yeah, right now we are doing uh, studio collections, which means that the creative team there that usually is under the direction of a creative director, they are the ones just creating a collection on their own. Usually in situations like this, a person who is on the creative team is told that they are now the creative director, but that their creative directing is not made public. So like if I went to Moschino after the next runway show they do, and I say like, 
who, who is the creative director? Could you please name them? They would say there is no creative director. Even if technically there is a person leading things, they're like, we are not ready to go public with the creative director because this is a standby. The most famous example of the standby creative director who turned out to be an absolute creative genius is Matthew Blasi, who was at Maison Martin Margiela before John Galliano got there. He was the secret creative director. And then we all like, the secret was out. We all found out and the Margiela heads were all like, ooh, I know who it is, I know who it is. And now he's the head of Bottega Veneta. Thankfully he is the head of Bottega Veneta. I fucking love his work at Bottega Veneta. Also, I guess like Michele is probably a good example of that at Gucci where they, uh, they got rid of their CD and there was like a vacuum and they were like, oh, I guess, well, I think they considered him to be a temporary creative director at the time. And then they were just like, man, this is great. Let's just keep it going. And he worked his way up at Gucci. He was a... He was, a, I think, head of uh, women's accessories. But yeah, who do I want there? I, I think that um, Christopher John Rogers would fucking crush it at Moschino. I think his sensibilities are very playful and he likes doing big stuff. He likes putting people in clothes that makes it where they're like, I am an event. And I feel like that with a little bit of cheekiness that he seems to be capable of doing, I feel like that would crush it at Moschino. I would love to see that. Another one that I've talked about previously is uh, Charles Jeffrey, because so much of his stuff is like very like tongue in cheek, ironic type of stuff. And boy, if like anybody is known for irony, it is uh, the, the original Mr. Moschino. He's like our OG fashion ironist. Demna could never. Yeah, I think they should get CJR in there for an audition. That would be sick. Do you think, this is a good follow up from earlier. Do you think fashion school reduces the creative expression of the students? No. Here's, here's a, um, this is a big tough love thing that um, I hope you will receive in the way that I intend it. Your teachers are not trying to put you in a box. Your teachers are not trying to suppress your creativity. They are trying to teach you the basic skills of your craft. And if you are not allowing them to do that, I think you should do some pretty serious self-reflection on why you are resisting that so much. I have big issues with authority. Um, I do not like being told what to do by anybody. I also am not very detail oriented. So if you put me in a situation where um, for something like sewing, where it's like you need to make sure that the seam is straight and like the two pieces need to be aligned even after you like turn the item and stuff. Nope, this is an eighth of an inch off. Remember they move, we need them to be together. I don't like being told shit like that. It's frustrating to me. And to me, I understand the feeling of you are trying to nitpick me out of expressing myself and getting my real intentions across it. My intentions are so much more important than this fucking eighth of an inch that you seem to think is so fucking important. Leave me alone. I am working. You don't get it. I understand all of those feelings completely. I get very emotional about this topic because I have learned the lesson, hopefully now, and I can see it on the other side. And I really want to save you, especially if you want fashion design to be your job, you need to grow the fuck up. It is possible. It is possible that school is not the best place for you. That is possible. But man, if you are paying, or if somebody very generous in your life is paying for all of that fashion school, fucking listen to them. Is this too much? No. They are not trying to limit your creativity. They are giving you tools so that you can express yourself better. And by the way, this is the, cra okay, this is the crazy thing that I have talked to so many students in fashion school. I have talked to fa literally thou probably over 10,000 students at this point through Instagram DMs. If you have a question, my DMs are always open. Fashion school is not completed work for your business. If your goal someday is to be a fashion designer that has their own company and you're in fashion school right now, my brother in Christ, you are a long way off from making work for your brand. This is not your official work yet. The stuff that you're making at school is for school. You can make other stuff outside of school, but you need to complete those assignments because frankly, if you don't know how to tailor a jacket, I don't wanna see some avant-garde design that you made because you don't know how to make clothes yet. Lee McQueen made some of the most bombastic, some of the best avant-garde design that has ever been produced by a human. This guy, could tailor things freehand. He understood how to cut clothes for the body so well that he, in some cases, for some dresses, did not need measuring instruments to cut the pattern out. He could cut it freehand with scissors. He had done it so many times because 
Lee worked at Sav McQueen worked at Savile Row under tailors who wouldn't who were like it's a half of a millimeter off that is unacceptable. He worked at Anderson and Shepard. It is one of the most highly regarded tailoring houses in the whole world. He then went to Romeo Gigli, a couple of other places. Then he founds his own house and he's able to do whatever he wants because he has the tools to be able to express himself. The difference between someone that doesn't know what they're doing and Lee McQueen is that when people take a picture of Lee McQueen's stuff, it looks like this. And when they put the clothes on, they say, I feel transformed by this. I feel like a different person when I put this on. This feels like it was meant for my body. If I'm being honest, I say this with love, I want you to win. None of this should be discouraging to you because you're still figuring it out. It's okay. The difference is that a lot of times I see young fashion designers who create something and it looks great in a photo, it's very aesthetic, but the person wearing it is like, it's not finished. It's, this is not really a jacket. You need both. Those clothes need to feel transformative when they go on somebody. You cannot get that if you start looking at the people who are authority figures, who know what they're talking about, if you are constantly looking at those people as the enemy. You gotta stop. I promise. I mean, I'm 34. I have, um, I have created a lot of pain for myself in my life because I have such a fucking problem with authority. Some of that is good. Questioning authority is always a helpful thing. Um, thinking of authority or any type of feedback as the enemy that will only create pain in your life. I want you to win. Please listen to the people to whom you are paying thousands of dollars to give you feedback. Please take advantage of it while you have it. I am not by, by any stretch saying that the person who asked this question has some kind of problem with authority or that they were there, but this is, um, yeah, your question just reminded me of that. This is part of why we don't say who is asking the questions because I never want people to like be like, wow, that specific asshole, I can see their face right there. What a dumb question. <laughs> I, never, I never want there to be confusion about that. I'm more taking them and just kind of free associating with whatever I want. That uh, may not even have been what you were specifically asking about, but that's what I wanted to say. So that's where we're at. Oh my gosh, we have covered so much. I am so exhausted. I am going to go to my mother-in-law's birthday party and then I'm gonna go pass out. Love you all a lot. Peace.